everyone and welcome to the third in my true crime series. I am so excited to be filming this particular video today because it's a case that I find so interesting. I like the details of this is just so bizarre you couldn't really make it up. So today I am going to be telling you about Ed Gein. Let's get started. As usual, disclaimer, this is quite graphic, quite gory, viewer discretion is advised. Okay, so even if you haven't heard directly of the name Ed Gein before, you will definitely know something about this guy, his crimes and his character and upbringing because he has inspired so many kind of creepy characters in cult horror films and books over the years. Um, most notably, if you've ever watched Psycho or watched Bates Motel on Netflix, then Norman Bates is based on Ed Gein. Similarly, if you've ever watched The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Leatherface is based on Ed Gein, as well as Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs. So his crimes and his life has bit like really inspired a lot of really creepy, scary, disturbing content over the years in popular culture but you will not believe the real details of um, his life and his case so I wanted to tell you a little bit more about him and what he did today. Okay so Edward Theodore Gein was born on the 26th of August 1906. He grew up in Wisconsin with his parents and his brother but his parents didn't have a very happy relationship. His father was an alcoholic and because of this his father found it quite hard to keep a job down. So quite early on in Ed's life the family decided to sell their grocery store and up and move they bought a 155 acre farm in the town of Plainfield, Wisconsin. Now obviously this was quite a change going from a small town to complete isolation. Ed's mum was quite strict, she was very religious and she was really kind of cautious about Ed and Henry, his brother, and who they interacted with, they were only allowed to leave the farm to go to school, that was it. And she was really concerned about people having a negative impact on her sons. So they obviously had quite strict upbringing. She actually used to read verses from the Bible to them every single night, but she would specifically choose quite disturbing graphic verses about death or murder or divine retribution. She kind of put the fear in the boys' heads. She also believed that all women were created as instruments by the devil, um, except for her. Women were bad people, as well as people who drank, were evil, stuff like that. Despite this, Ed did quite well at school, although he was known to be really shy, and also apparently he had some strange mannerisms, such as he would just randomly burst out laughing, as if laughing at his own jokes. Um, people did think he was a little bit shy, but also his mother used to punish him if he ever tried to make new friends. In 1940, Ed's father George passed away because of heart failure due to his excessive of drinking and alcoholism and so Ed and Henry started doing extra little jobs around the town as like handymen to help make a little bit more extra income so they'd go and fix things for people in the town and Ed also started babysitting which he apparently really enjoyed he was said to get on much better with children than adults after a while Ed's older brother Henry met a woman and decided to move in with her she was a divorced single mother of two and I think for him, this started to raise concerns about his relationship with their own mother. He started to vocalise to Ed about how he was so attached to their own mum and that the relationship wasn't necessarily that normal. Um, Henry planned to move out with this um, new partner of his and so he'd voice his concerns a lot more freely to Ed, who, whenever he heard this, would uh, react really shocked and upset. He like got really defensive about it and he was very protective about his mother. Now on May 16th 1944 both of the boys were burning some vegetation on their farm and apparently the fire got out of control and it spread really quickly and the fire department were called. After the fire was extinguished Ed noticed and realised that his brother was missing and so a search party ensued and his brother's body was finally found face down in the ground. It originally appeared that his brother had suffered heart failure and this was purely because he hadn't had any burns on his body and he hadn't been hurt otherwise. Later it was reported that his brother actually was found with bruises on his head but the police didn't suspect any foul play and they just put the death down to asphyxiation. Saying that though no autopsy was ever performed on Henry's body so no one still actually knows what the actual cause of death was and whether it was murder or not. So Ed and his mother Augusta were now left 
alone but shortly after Henry's death then his mother had quite a bad paralyzing stroke and so Ed kind of devoted himself then to looking after and caring for her however she did pass away on December 29th 1945 at the age of 67 and Ed as you can imagine was obviously very devastated he obviously had a very close intense relationship and bond with his mum which did look odd to others um, even his brother and so this kind of affected him in a really big way. Ed obviously inherited the farm and the family home but one thing he did do after his mother's death which was a little bit bizarre was he started boarding up all of the rooms in the house that she ever used. Pretty much all of the upstairs he boarded up and it was remained in perfect condition and untouched. He also boarded up the living room and that left him just to a tiny room next door to the kitchen which became his living space and it wasn't a very nice living space it was quite quite a mess as I'm sure you can imagine also around this time Ed became quite interested in kind of death cult magazines and also adventure stories specifically those containing stories of cannibalism this is where the story starts to get a little bit disturbing but also I find absolutely fascinating so on the 16th of November 1957 a hardware store owner called Bernice Warden in the town of Plainfield where Gein lived she disappeared. No one could find her and the store was remained closed for the entirety of that day and so around 5pm her son who was uh, in the police department, he was Deputy Sheriff Frank Warden, he went to the shop to have a look around and that was when he noticed that the cash register in the store was open and that also there was blood on the floor. Now he had noted that Ed Gein had visited his mum's store the evening before she disappeared and apparently he was supposed to return the next morning to pick up a gallon of antifreeze and the receipt for this transaction that morning before she disappeared was the last one written out by Bernice. Ed was obviously immediately arrested, he was arrested in a grocery shop and then the police department went ahead to start searching his farm. Disclaimer, this next bit isn't very nice. They unfortunately found her body in a shed on Ed's farm. She had been decapitated and she was hanging upside down by a crossbar. She also had ropes on her wrists. She had been shot and she had been badly mutilated. And while searching Ed's farm and house, the police made an array of other discoveries. Now I'm gonna read some of these out and you will not believe some of the stuff that they found in his house. They found a corset made from a female torso skinned from shoulders to waist. They found bowls made out of human skulls. They found leggings made from human leg skin. Skulls on his bedposts, human skin covering several chair seats masks made from the skin of female heads. They found a woman called Mary Hogan's face mask in a paper bag and also her skull in a box. They found Bernice Warden's entire head in a burlap sack and her heart in a plastic bag in front of Gein's pot-bellied stove. Nine vulva in a shoebox. They found a belt made from human nipples. Four noses. A pair of lips on a window shade drawstring. A lampshade made from the skin of human face and fingernails from female victims as well as multiple bones and more body parts around the house. What had Ed been doing since his mother had passed away? All of these things were photographed before they were destroyed. You can, if you dare, go and see the images of some of these things I have. They are very disturbing. So Gein had told investigators that during the years of 1947 to 1952, he had made as many as 40 nocturnal visits to the local graveyard where he had dug up uh, new fresh graves and taken the bodies to his farm. However, he said he did most of these in a daze like state. On at least 30 of the visits, he had woken up from a daze and realised that he was in the graveyard and gone home and empty handed but on the remaining times he had only realised what he had done once he'd got back to the farm and that he was completely in like a dreamlike state when he was doing this. He specifically dug up the bodies of elderly women who he thought looked like and resembled his mother and he would take them home and tan their skin I guess as you would with when you're making leather um, and then with those 
pieces of skin he would make objects. So it was quite soon after his mother's death that he started working on this and his idea was to create a human suit of his mother that he could literally crawl into the skin of. He wanted to crawl into the skin of his mum. He also denied having sex with any of the bodies saying that they had smelled too bad and he did admit shooting another woman. Her name was Mary Hogan. That was the other skull and kind of face mask that they had found in his property. She was a tavern owner who had disappeared and been missing since 1954 but he denied any memory of her death or of killing her. One thing I found and read whilst researching this case was this. I'm going to read this out because it's so disturbing. A 16 year old youth whose parents were friends of Gein reported that Gein kept shrunken heads in his house, which Gein had described as relics from the Philippines sent by a cousin who had served in the islands during World War II. Upon investigation by the police, these were determined to be human facial skins carefully peeled by corpses and used as masks by Gein. So this young person who had been spending a lot of time with Gein over the over the years since his mother's death had seen these shriveled shrunken heads and Gein had made up a complete false lie about where they had come from when they were in fact real human face masks. On the 21st of November 1957, Gein was read his charges as being one count of first degree murder, to which he pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. He was then diagnosed as being schizophrenic and found mentally incompetent, which left him unfit for his trial. He was sent to the Central State Hospital for the Criminally Insane in Wisconsin, before then being moved to the Medota State Hospital in Madison. In 1968, doctors found him mentally able enough to participate in his defence and so the trial began on the 7th of November 1968 and it lasted for one week. He testified that he was trying to load a bullet into his rifle which had accidentally shot Bernice Warden and that he hadn't done it on purpose or intentionally and he doesn't remember anything else that happened after that. His trial was held without a jury and on the 14th of November he was found guilty. However, a second control had to be held to test his sanity and he was found not guilty by reason of insanity and so therefore spent the remainder of his life in a hospital. Something also that really fascinates me about this case is what happened to his house and his property after. His house was scheduled to be auctioned um, afterwards because apparently it was said to become a massive tourist attraction to the area. Loads of people were fascinated and wanted to go and visit it. However, on March 27th, the same year, um, it was destroyed in a fire and people suspect arson but it wasn't ever kind of um, looked into basically so the house no longer exists however the car that Gein used to kind of ship the bodies to and from the graveyard to his house was uh, sold at an auction to a guy called Bunny Gibbons who was a carnival kind of sideshow host and he set it up in his carnival and charged people 25 cents to come and see the car. Just thought that was really fascinating. On July 26th, 1984, Gein passed away from lung cancer at the age of 77. So that is the case of Ed Gein. I hope you found it quite interesting. The thing that really stood out to me um, whilst researching this case was uh, his upbringing. Was it the way that his mother brought him up to be quite a recluse and have such an intense bond with him that made him the way he was and made him do the things he did? Or was he just born with that from the get-go? It's so interesting to me whether it's nature or nurture with stuff like cases like this with serial killers. I do think his mum had a big part to play in um, his kind of antisocialness and the fact he wanted to recreate her and literally become her and step into her skin. Um, it's just so interesting to me. I would love to hear what you think about the case below. If you do look up any pictures, I apologise. Um, they, I just find it, stuff like that absolutely fascinating. I will leave some links to where I got some of this information down below, but there are so many great podcasts about Ed Gein as well, specifically the True Crime Garage one is just incredible. If there are any other cases you would like me to cover in this series, do let me know, leave me a comment down below also. 
be sure to subscribe and I will be back again very soon. Bye.